and welcome back to The Good Grief Conversation. I'm your host, Janet Jones, and this week is week two of our series on when a loved one dies. Right now, it's sort of the end of October, and around the world, this is the time of the year when people celebrate their dead and look at their ancestors and remember them. Remember last week, we spoke with Dying Matters, and they have this campaign that they're doing called Hashtag I Remember, giving people the opportunity all over the world to remember their loved ones. And, you know, it can be really hard on people remembering their loved ones, but also it can bring real joy and it's an opportunity to bring them back to life and, you know, experience their favorite meals, their favorite drinks, share their stories and those kind of things. And that brings a lot of healing for a lot of people. Now, not for everybody. I am having conversations at the moment with people online and and I know that that isn't for everybody. See how you feel. See if this works for you. You know, maybe try that celebration. And I hope that in these coming weeks that you will get a lot out of learning about, you know, when a loved one dies. Which brings me on to today's conversation. In the past, I've had guests who have offered inspiring journeys that they have had throughout their life, through their losses. And generally, they've been, you know, a few years down the line and they've got those golden nuggets for us to learn from and use in our journey also. Today, I am talking to David Collingwood from the Co-op Funeral Services. And the reason why I've decided to do this is because in the journey of grief, which is the main conversation here, funerals are inevitably a big part of this journey. And, you know, I wanted to speak with somebody in this field to learn more about them and what brings them into doing this service. The funeral director that I had was absolutely amazing. And I will be sharing those stories in the conversation. Also, I just want to say that, you know, this, I, I'm pretty confident is going to be a bit of a challenging conversation for me because it's going to take me back to the worst time of my life. And it's going to be challenging. So, you know, do excuse me if I lose it a little bit or whatever, but it's the way that it is. It it is as it is. This is now life, but that's all good. It's a subject that really, unless it's in your life, you actually don't even want the conversation. Why would you want to get to know about this industry when you don't have to? But the thing is, it is good to know of the industry and the love and the kindness and the compassion that is in a way built into it. And it is also part of the grieving journey when you have this kindness and compassion at that most difficult time that you are facing. So there will be some great information in here. If you are in a a time of your life where you have a loved one who's getting sick and you feel that this is an inevitable part of your journey, then this conversation is for you. And I'm sure you will get a lot from this. So it is now my pleasure to introduce you to David Collingwood from the Co-op Funeral Services. David, welcome to the Good Grief Conversation. I will be perfectly honest, I've been anticipating our conversation for personal reasons, as you know, but I'm I'm up for the conversation because the service I received was absolutely second to none. And actually, I believe he used to work for the co-op, so he's had training from you guys. Just tell us all a little bit about yourself, David, and, you know, why funerals for you? What is it that inspires you on that? Because there's, you know, there's something in all of us that takes us a longer journey in life. What's the reason behind you doing what you do and what do you do? First of all, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And I'm, I love talking about what I do and I love talking about this fantastic profession because funeral directors and good funeral directors can make such a really positive impact on people's lives by simply helping and and supporting them at that time of most difficult loss. And I think I've been immensely lucky, you know, I'm into my early fifties now 
I have done nothing but want to be a funeral director. You know, as a kid, we live next door to a funeral directors in Bradford in West Yorkshire. And as an eight year old, I invited myself over the garden wall and, you know, helped the guys washing the hearses and the limousines. I was a bit of a car nut, still am really. And I was fascinated really by the, the vehicles. And then gradually it became, you know, I was putting handles on coffins on a Saturday and really they couldn't get rid of me. And as a, I suppose I was quite a strange child in a sense, but it was just seemed to me to be such a wonderful profession, just a wonderful skill to be able to have, to be able to look after families and, and, and offer that practical support, you know, that emotional support that you need to do, but also deal with some of the practicalities that necessarily need to be done. I did my A-levels, I was going to go and do a degree, but I just realised that it would be even harder to get a role in the profession because I knew I'd have to start really right at the at the bottom, you know, in order to, to get a foothold. My dad was the local GP, the local doctor, so, you know, we had no tradition in the family at all. Jokingly, I used to say that I'd be following in his footsteps one way or the other, and I started, it was almost like a, an unofficial YTS type role. This was a training scheme for sort of school leavers at the time and I was literally you know sweeping garage floors washing cars doing some of the more more basic things and I was lucky enough to move around in the city to find a role as a as a trainee funeral director at another company and, and from there I, I did some qualifications in the funeral industry the diploma in funeral directing and, and I also became a, an embalmer I, I trained and became an embalmer as well and and from there I was lucky enough really to fall into um, first of all, funeral director roles and then um, sort of management roles within that area. I joined the co-op, been with the co-op now for nearly 32 years. Luckily enough, you know, moving around in, in various roles from being a funeral home manager, uh, a regional manager, to then become a general manager of a, a whole funeral division, effectively an operations director for the biggest funeral directors in the country, co-op funeral care. Currently, my, my role is director of funerals for the whole of, of co-op funeral care. So I support my colleagues with technical issues they may have are supporting the right behaviours and, and the right focus and I guess I'm the voice for the families that we look after and obviously a voice for the deceased as well who clearly are, are people who are in our care who can't speak for themselves and you know and that's important as well for me and, and for our business as well to understand what those standards are so I've been really lucky to be in a profession that I've always wanted to be in and I still still want to be in and I still every day I, I learn something else about this profession. Yes yeah and I'm sure you've helped so many families throughout your career at their most challenging of times in life. I, I can't think of a more challenging time so you've come, you know, face to face with people when they are at their worst. What is it in a funeral director that you think attracts you to people who are at that time in their life? You know, when most people would rather cross the street than see somebody broken. Yeah. But you walk right into it. I think probably probably my background. I mentioned my dad was a doctor, my mum was a, a nurse and then a teacher and I'm one of five kids and you know I've got a brother who's a watch commander in the fire service, I've got a, a sister who's a paediatric nurse in the community, another who's a physiotherapist. So I think we've we've kind of always leaned a little bit towards you know wanting to help people and wanting to make a difference. I guess my profession, a lot of people think funeral directors are the sort of hook-nosed, very elderly gentlemen, you know, dandruff on the collar and, and walking around in dark clothes and being ever so, you know, ever so humble. And I think probably in my career, I wanted to change that perception of, of what we did. And I wanted to really highlight what a good funeral professional is able to do in order to help people. I was still amazed as when I was a more regular funeral director dealing with families earlier in my career, I couldn't quite get over the fact that despite going through sometimes severe trauma and the most difficult period of, of a person's life and having to organise a funeral with me, you know, spending, you know, a considerable amount of, of money as well. That funerals aren't, aren't cheap things. I still couldn't get over the fact that, you know, some families would send a card or a letter or, or make that gesture of saying, do you know what you did? I really, really want to say thank you. We couldn't have got through this without you. And I found that immensely humbling because I just thought the stuff you're going through, the things you're having to deal with, and yet you're still taking the time to personally thank me for what I did and my team for what they did. And I, and I still find that humbling when I go into a funeral home and see those thank you cards, which our funeral directors and funeral arrangers proudly display 
that helping part is something that I've always wanted to do. And we're, we're here to do a really important job. I mean, a funeral is just, it's such an important part, I think, of, of the bereavement process. And I, I'm not saying it helps get over bereavement. It doesn't. You, you learn to start to live with bereavement and you know you'll you'll experience yourself bereavement is so unique it's unique to your relationship with the person that you've lost so people that say well you know it's been a year you must be pulling yourself together now and getting over it no not at all but the funeral plays such an important process in that learning to live with something and I think making sure that the right choices have been made that the funeral reflects you know the life of the person that has died is such an important part I think as humans and as humanity for us to to start to learn to live with that loss and learn to live with that gap in our lives absolutely and I, well first of all I would say there's no getting over the loss of any relationship because that loss changes you and you then have to transition into the next phase of your life as you're left here to live so when I hear of anybody saying getting over there isn't getting over indicates that you're going to be back to where you were before the incident happened and, and that's just not true and so you're right though that the funeral experience and the experience with the funeral director uh, it's vitally important to the healing journey in it's the first step really in a way because outside of your family and friends it's the first person you connect with to share excuse me this really intimate story you know clearly the funeral director really understands his or her role properly that privilege of actually being there looking after someone's loved one you know their last few days on the planet you know physically in the physical form but that privilege of actually being there at, at your side and being there to to help you and to guide you Funeral directors can influence the bereaved. They can influence them into, you know, making choices that perhaps aren't the right ones. But good funeral directors and good funeral directors is actually about listening and then having conversations about the choices and making sure that all of the choices around the funeral are informed and, and, and actually, you know, really mean something and people actually understand, you know, what they're doing. And I think I'm really proud of my colleagues because I know that they're, they're able to do that. Their, their first priority is the family they're looking after. We don't have customers. We have families that we look after. We have clients because we form a, a professional relationship, but it's a hugely privileged position to be, to be able to be allowed into someone's grief and someone's feeling of desolation and to be allowed in there and say look I, I can't make things better but what I can do is show you sincerely that in these first few days it's almost like the paramedic at the scene of the crash where we're there to stop you bleeding we're there to, to splint the bones we're there to find the right place for you to continue your grief journey by organizing the funeral in a way that you feel is appropriate and, and fitting it's not transactional our, our role it, it is about a relationship and making sure that family see us as friends I'm quite a shy person I'm quite introverted really but when I'm b being a funeral director I step out of myself and become that person yeah I guess that's um, seeing people suffering as well isn't it you know when you see somebody suffering you put your own thoughts and worries to one side like you say it's the paramedic at the scene the paramedic at the scene is not thinking of him he's thinking of the person that he's there to help to do that but you never block or you can never block things out you know I, I've, I've never been able to do that for good or for bad there is always something that you know I will bring home or take home or, or something that's close to my life and my lived experience but I think that that's what makes you a better person because actually you go through that and you empathize more when you start to realize that was close to home and if I ever saw anyone who wasn't able or, or was almost clocking in and clocking out in their role I think they were probably ready to, to find something else to do because you've got to give something of yourself you always have because families can spot insincerity you know and, and and it's really easy to see and to spot and actually that's not what we're about and it, it, it is that element of being able to be there and understand the privileged position that you're in but understand the responsibility you've got as well you are supporting that that person or that family but you're also almost in a sense protecting them from from some of the things and actually understanding that you don't have to do what you think the family think you should do 
actually what's more important is the funeral is organized in a way that you're comfortable with and you you have the permission to do whatever you want if you think that that's appropriate and i think probably in these later years and we're seeing more and more choice being displayed by families and encouraged as well by funeral directors not ill-informed but informed choice because actually it's that reflection time. Yes, I think when it's a sudden death, though, and it, it's something completely out of the blue, there isn't time to think of any of that. You know, I think with my son, you know, he was very environmental and all the things that he cared about. Oh, my God, my world was so blasted apart. I couldn't think about that. And for me, it was I had just had to hand it over to my funeral director. And he actually chose everything for me. And, and he didn't charge a, an arm and a leg. He was so kind. He was so considerate. I, there was no way I could think. And I was pretty much left to all of that myself. My other two children, they couldn't handle something like that. My ex-husband, he's far away and and he was in shock as well. And so he didn't. And it was between me and the funeral director, actually. In fact, it was the funeral director because I was in pieces too. But I do remember one thing, like when you were just saying there about how it becomes a part of you and, and how much you care. And I always remember my funeral director saying to me that, you know, they treated Murray like one of their own. That meant such a lot to me because it made me think, oh, well, he's safe there, you know, which seems crazy really because he's not really there but but just knowing that like you said the last few days or a week or so their body is being really taken care of and really I felt he really loved my son you know it's like which was an honour you know that that's the privilege of the position that, that we're in and I think it also is really clear about the culture of an organisation because because I'm frustrated that my profession, anyone can be a funeral director. You just need to put a sign up and have a telephone and you can operate as a funeral director. You don't need to be registered, regulated or qualified. And that makes me sad, but it's never stopped me from wanting to actually push the professionalism and the, the right care as strongly as I can. And I've, I've always said to my colleagues that you know, our culture is about the things that we do when nobody is looking. It's about how we act, you know, back of house and, you know, in a mortuary. And it's about the conversation and it's about the dignity that we afford the deceased person, the dead person. Because actually that's the psychological contract we have with the, the family that have asked us to look after things is that's what we're expected to do and you know we won't have anything less than that that professionalism you know it might sound weird you know but before we I would go into a, a chapel where a, a deceased person may be may be resting I, I always knock on the door you'd be freaked out if they said come in I, I always knock on the door and you know a lot of people say why'd you do that and I say yeah, come in <laughs> It's just a check. It's just that odd thing of just saying, I do it out of respect for the person that's that's in the room. It's about actually understanding that they're the centre of, of my attention and not just a body in a room and, you know, I'm, I'm coming in to do a check. It's, you know, the way that we, we care for the deceased and handle the deceased is, I've always said, we should be able to, if we're asked by a member of the family, we should be able to bring them into any part of our premises and any part of our business to reassure them that, the, that our equipment, our attitude, our approach, our checks, everything that we do are something that we're very proud of. And I think, you know, you mentioned that conversation or that the, you didn't make those decisions and, the, and your funeral director sort of did that. And I think what he will have done is listened, you know, and hopefully, you know, those choices that were made that you felt he'd done is actually as a result of the conversation that you were you were able to have and his understanding of the, the sort of thing that you would want. I mean, you you lose somebody suddenly, it just completely knocks you off your feet. I'm, I, I can't even imagine, you know, what you've been through and what you are going through. I think that's hugely difficult, but I'm, I'm just so glad, I'm so proud of my profession that the funeral director who looked after you and the family did so in a, in a way that you found helpful and supportive. Well, you certainly never expect to be in my position. And I have lost both my mom and my dad. But during that time, all my myself and my siblings, we dealt with it together. But suddenly when you're dealing with this on your own, that's a, just a different ball game altogether. And the where, where I use, it's actually just down the road from me. And I drive past it all the time. And 
And when it very first came, I can't remember what kind of shop it was before, but then it, it became this funeral director's. And I, I remember we're driving past it and I look at it and I say, oh, my goodness, that looks a really bleak place. You know, it's all quite Victorian chairs and all of this. And but I'll tell you what, I like I, say, I never, ever thought I would be using their services. But when I did have to call on their services, the environment was so friendly. It was like walking into home. It was like walking into another living room. It was be It was beautiful. It's so important, I think. And I think what we've done a lot of work with our, because we're a national funeral directors at the co-op, you know, we have a national brand. And we, one of the things that we did do was we wanted to make our premises look quite open and inviting. And a lot of people in, where we've done refurbishments have been a bit surprised that we've taken blinds down, that we've put lighting inside, that we've we've tried to make um, our premises more accessible precisely because of when you thought you'd need to use a funeral director, it seemed quite bleak and austere and Victorian. And, and happily, you know, when you had to engage them, you know, it was it was OK and it was comfortable. We, we want people to actually see us and f see our people, you know, at a desk within a funeral home. And we're not the hook-nosed, greying, elderly gentlemen we you know we have you know a high proportion of uh, female colleagues you know work for us in, in all our roles and it's really important we represent the community that we work in as well you know we, we you know we should represent the, the the racial mix of of a community as well in order to be relevant and, and be there to to help that community and that and that's very important and it's a bit it's a, an odd thing because i'll talk about funeral premises that we have and i talk to friends and family and say well, I've, I've lived there for 25 years i've never seen it it's because you, you don't notice something until you actually really need to use it. And, and, and then it's there. And I think for us, I think it's, it's very important. When, but, you know, that's bricks and mortar, that's premises. What's really important are the people, the people that we have and their approach. Absolutely. Because, you know, you can have the best premises, you can have the best vehicles. But actually, if your emphasis on service and care isn't there, then you will not thrive as a business. Yeah, and I guess, you know, my experience of going in, I said it felt like home. It wasn't the furnishings or anything. The, the home was the people, you know, that, that opened the door and welcomed me in, you know, that's the thing. But talking of opening doors and being welcomed in, I mean, COVID now is causing huge problems for people. And right at the beginning of our conversation, we were saying that, you know, this is a big part of that early bereavement stage. What are people doing now and, and how are they surviving? And With the first lockdown announcement, that was, you know, in late March, and we were already seeing, obviously, an increase in, in deaths, but relatively no restrictions on people's movement and on funeral attendance. And I think with the announcement of the lockdown, it, it not only affected the funerals of people who were looking after a, a loved one who had died from COVID, but it immediately affected all of the funerals that we had arranged for families who, who had lost someone, who, someone had died, but it wasn't as a result of, of COVID. We had to visit those families and explain to them that the government were restricting the number of people who could attend a service. There were going to be no church services possible for people who would organise church services. There, were, there was going to be fundamental changes. And, you know, those weeks, remember, you couldn't mix in households. You couldn't go and, and hug your loved one. You couldn't do all of those things. And that first part of COVID affected people in, in a lot of ways. Now, we did a lot of campaigning at government level because we can. We're the co-op and, you know, we have some, some great colleagues whose role is around liaising with government and, and really trying to explain. And together with the trade associations as well, our professional associations, we were able to, to gradually ask the government to think about easing some of the, the funeral attendance. But we did have a lot of local councils who were very worried around having, you know, lots of people attending funeral services and were very reluctant to increase the number of people who, who could attend. We realised that actually in, in lockdown, a lot of people were, well, there's not going to be many people there. There's, there's some services that are just not going to use of yours, you know, limousines, for example, or embalming or, or those kind of things. And what we did is we looked at the services we offered and we reorganised them so that actually, you know, for families who wanted a very simple service, we were able to do that and, and not have the cost involved in, in providing those other things. And we were, we were trying to be creative as well around 
you know, perhaps for families who were having to isolate, you know, that we, we would bring the hearse to the house. For friends and neighbours who couldn't attend the funeral, because, you know, a lot of areas it was a maximum of 10 people, you know, bringing the hearse to the house and, and, and going on a specific route allow people to come out. And rather than just just bow their head respectfully, people were applauding, you know, as the hearse slowly, slowly passed. We did a, a lot in terms of the media as well around, you know, reminding people if you see a hearse, for example, don't just see it as a hearse, see it as there's a, a person inside or a person who happens to be dead. But following that hearse, a very family who were going through a very restricted funeral, please just stop for a moment and take out your headphones or take off your cap. Do something that just shows that family that you're recognising that they're, you know, their loss and you're empathising just by simply pausing for a few moments. And, you know, that was difficult. And for us funeral directors who are hardwired to want to help families, you're hardwired to want to organise and, and, and make the funeral as, as tailor-made as it, it possibly can be and as, as reflective of a person's life. When you're unable to do that, because of the government restrictions, it is difficult and it, it is a challenge. But we've seen, we've seen with the easing of the restrictions, we're able now, you know, to see more people able to attend the funeral. And there is now a maximum of 30 people allowed at a funeral, providing it can be socially distanced. That thankfully for all three tiers as well, so medium, high and very high tiers, you know, that the, the government have recognised the importance of bereavement and grieving. And they've recognised that actually it's it's a huge thing. It's huge. It's absolutely huge because it's not only the funeral, is it? It's the celebration after. My son's celebration was, well, it was like a, a party of a 22-year-old. And, you know, there were his mates. They did get drunk and you know, they did go out partying after. And for me, that was important. Now, as a mother, it was the last thing that I wanted to do. But somehow you get propped up for the sake of the person you are saying goodbye to and, you know, wanting to do it how they would want it. You know, I just think the whole day is really vital, not just the funeral bit, but just going back to the bit where you were just saying about taking the hearse on the route and getting people to come out. Or if you see somebody, you know, just bow your head. You reminded me, actually, of I think I would have been about 15 years old. And then one of my favorite uncles died, my uncle Billy, and he was a lollipop man. And it, again, he was quite a tragic death. He was knocked off his bike. Uh, he had a, a push bike that he cycled and a car wing mirror knocked his handles and he fell off and bashed his head on the curb. So it was a, it was a huge shock. And he lived in, the, in this little town in Lancashire called Atherton. So we're talking, I know, 40 years ago. And I remember being in the car behind the hearse and all the streets in Atherton were lined with these guys, some with lollipop sticks and some just people who had known Uncle Billy for years. But it was in the days when all the men wore their, their flat caps. Do you know what? It was the most beautiful thing. As we drove down the street, as we went past, <laughs> I'm going to go again, everyone just took off their cap and put it on their chest and bowed their head. And it's like, oh, that's to my Uncle Billy. You know, he's not royalty, but it was it was just such a beautiful thing to do that I just think, you know, actually death and the end of life, it seems to bring the best out in people and the most kindness out in people. You just think, why can't we be that kind when everyone's alive, <laughs> you know? Such a simple gesture, isn't it? But I think it's an acknowledgement almost of mortality. It's an acknowledgement of what that family going through, you know, that, that are travelling behind that hearse. And that could be me. Yeah, that could be me in there. So it's re it's acknowledging that and our finite existence as well, isn't it? We live such busy lives, I think, now. And I think these are points in life, ironically, because of death, where we should stop and reflect. And it, it only takes a few minutes. And I think where where we see it, you know, driving a cortege or, or, or whatever, it, it is, it's lovely to see actually that gesture being done now. And I've, I've driven hundreds of limousines with a family in the back who find it so humbling and so supportive that actually when someone does it, and it can be a, it can be a young lad taking off his baseball cap, you know, somebody who you perhaps wouldn't, but actually that gesture, it means so much to people. And I think we, we kind of forget some of those things, I think, in life, some of those points where we should, you know, turn the music off in the car, slow down, don't hurry to overtake 
just understand, just have a an inkling of what's going through that that poor family's you know minds at the moment and what they're having to prepare themselves to do. Yes, and nobody gets away with this. It is something for all of us. And in fact, in a way, I see now that recognising that, that death is a part of everyone's life actually makes you live more. You know, you, you see life more when death is in your face. And in a way, that's what COVID has done. COVID has been a really big eye opener to just about everybody. I, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who hasn't now reflected their life and what life now means to them. What would you think? I absolutely agree. And I think I think it has brought home, you know, because of the things that we weren't allowed to do. And actually, we, we then said, hang on a minute, let's highlight the things that we actually can do. Let's be positive about this, help people, you know, start to realise that actually, it's not as bad as you think, we will we'll be able to support you to some degree. And I think I've always had conversations around death, because I've always been involved with death. And, and dying and for me it, it's not unusual and for my family I guess um, our two girls I remember Kitty our youngest she's 20 now and I remember when she was only about seven or eight she was really into Doctor Who at the time and I left one of our trade journals uh, you know just on the kitchen table it's a normal thing in our house it's you know, nothing but carb and she was looking through it and she saw a picture of a coffin but the coffin was designed to be like a TARDIS from Doctor Who and she said she looked up at me you know this young girl and said daddy when I die that's what I want for my funeral for me it, it was all suddenly I was I was thinking about the funeral of my daughter and all of those things and then actually the next wave was well how great that she knew exactly what that was and she felt able to talk about that and in her innocence, be able to actually say, yeah, you know, that's what that's what I want when, when I die. And that part of that conversation, I think, is really important that we all should have to a greater or lesser degree, de dependent on how comfortable you are, you know, talking about death, either your own mortality or that of, of someone you love. But I've sat with too many families where when you start to have a conversation that they have no idea what their loved one wants. They're, they're looking to you as the funeral director to help and advise. And I think that's such a shame because you want at least to know, you know, what are the things that the person would have wanted or, or wouldn't have wanted? You know, were you ever able to have that conversation? And we should be brave enough to have these conversations, aren't we? Now, obviously, I always expected to go before all of my children. So we have actually had this conversation because I, yeah, and I've always believed that, you know, if you can accept birth into your life, then you need to accept death because it is the journey. You can't deny that. It just is the way that it is. So I have been quite open to accepting death. Now, I don't like it. I do not like the fact that my son is no longer here, but I can't change that. Therefore, I must accept that. I accepted him being born and I must accept the, you know, the next bit. And there are many parents who have gone through this, but I have now gone full circle with my son or the physical circle. But what I have always said to my kids, right, for my funeral, I want a disco ball and 80s music. You can come dressed in 80s stuff, but you're dancing, right? That's just it because you're celebrating my life. I don't want doom and gloom. Life is a great gift. It's a privilege, you know, one in a 400 trillion chances of us being alive. Well, that is way better than winning the national lottery. So, you know, let's treat it as a lottery. So I, I was always like forceful with my kids, right? It's got to be a celebration, you know, but I do feel for the people now who can't have that celebration. You know, we did celebrate my son's life. I would want mine celebrated. But so many people, you just can't do that now. I have, and, and there are restrictions on, on, you know, on public gathering, for example. So I talked about the limit of 30, uh, and that's in England, Wales and Scotland. But the most important part of a funeral for a lot of people is afterwards, you know, at the reception or the, or, the, or the wake, as we call it, where you're able to talk to people, you're able to share memories and those positive memories. of, of And sometimes you get insight into stories that you've not heard from before and you actually see the impact. Trust <laughs> me, I heard many stories. I didn't want to hear really, but I know. I know I know how many girlfriends he had and it's like oh my goodness son <laughs> in a sense that's the beauty of that and, and his friends been able to share that and to, to have that joint trust to be able to share and say this is the person I knew and loved 
you know, and, and actually you, you take away from that such positive things, I think. And I think that's probably where we're, for practical reasons, we're still not able to, to get back to, to where we should be in terms of being able to encourage that, that dialogue and that thought to be physically present and to have that physical essentially physical contact we're tactile people we want we want a hug we want a touch we, we need all of those things and and sadly you know we're not able to do that so what we're trying to do and we're trying to help families be as creative as possible to be able to to have the conversation and also to be able to have the permission to organize a funeral in the way that they want that to be organized our role is to guide them through the some of the restrictions some of some of the things that can't be done but actually we focus on the things that can be done as well and we've seen some terrific funeral themes and some terrific actions as well that our teams have been able to facilitate for families and you know the more creative you are I think the more helpful you can be for families I mean it doesn't suit everyone it does you know the personalization the, the celebration of a life doesn't suit everyone some people that doesn't work for them they need a more formal process and and that's fine you know because we're we're all different and you know we're there to organize a funeral in the way that a family want that funeral to be organized what we have seen is is some families who have had that conversation and, and have actually pre-arranged the funeral you know perhaps years before before the the, the funeral's actually needed for two practical reasons you know the cost of the funeral is, is fixed and, and and doesn't increase but also putting your wishes down on paper you're basically telling your loved ones, look, it's all sorted. My decisions are the things that I want. It's all down on paper. All you need to do is just ring the funeral director and they, they have the details and they, they will organise that. And I think that, again, is it's a hard thing to face. It's this, we all die. Why should it be so hard? But it is because you, you're reflecting, actually, this is what will happen when I die. I've mentioned I've been a funeral director all my life. It was only within the last 10 years that I could get my mum and dad to pre-organize their funerals i've been telling them for years yeah telling them for years we really need to get this done and it's not like i'm wanting to rush you off or anything but you know there's some pra practical things we've not really talked about that actually we could get down and it and my dad was very matter of fact oh we'll be all right and we'll just deal with it at the time I said no no you're, you're a yorkshireman like me let's be practical and, and say look you can fix the cost as well for people you know and there'd be nothing extra to pay and I, and we finally did it and it was okay it wasn't strange it didn't feel unusual it was more around well that's done now we've done it that was out of the way and, and done but it, it's a difficult thing I think mortality facing to the inevitable you know that that none of us can avoid yeah it's funny you know years ago I interviewed my previous job to my son changing my whole life I was a happiness expert and so I did happiness training and I would interview people and talk about happiness and I got the great privilege to interview the these two old ladies and I think they were both either 95 or 97 sharp as anything fantastic women both of them called Edna there was a little Edna and big Edna and this was little Edna and we were talking then about money and funerals and planning and all this kind of stuff so when you were talking about money she said well I don't think money's that important you just have enough to live by and the other one said have you been saving up for your funeral she went Oh, I haven't done any of that. She said, well, they're not going to leave me on the top, are they? <laughs> I just thought, what a beautiful mindset and just a, a really refreshing. She was from Huddersfield just down the road. Only a Yorkshire person could have that. <laughs> Because they're not going to leave me on the top. Amazing. And I do think it is. It's important to even know that this is going to be part of your life, part of your family. At some point, all families will require your services. It's not for everyone. And I think, you know, anyone listening to this who, who suddenly feels, oh, my goodness, how, how do I broach this the subject? I think, you know, nowadays we, there's so much on the television you know, and, and in dramas and in soaps and, and often in the news there'll be funerals or there'll be a death related scene or, or whatever and I, I think that's the opportunity to to be able to pick up the phone or to to turn to your left and say this is what I want or this is what I don't want you know I, ooh, I don't want burying you know or I don't want cremating or just just giving people just an idea and indication your loved ones take so much off the shoulders place and people are are worried that the decisions they're making and the choices they're making may not be what their loved one wanted you're doing the best that you could possibly do you know take comfort in that you, you there's just no other way would you know well it's funny because that was the like the major dilemma for me right at the beginning i'm thinking well 
you know, we may have spoken about my death and what I wanted, not that I could ever decide whether I wanted cremating or burying. I used to, well, you know, I want to be buried and a tree planted that has flowers so I can flower every spring. And then I heard about this service where you could go up in a firework. So that I was like, oh, well, maybe I need to be cremated. I said, well, how am I going to do that and have a tree? And my daughter said, so now you want us to chop you in half, do you? She went, I don't think we'd be allowed to do that. Got the solution for you. We can put some of your ashes in the firework and then the rest of your ashes we can bury. Oh, you do, do you? And then you can have the tree as well. But I do think, you know, it's quite nice to, like, we're laughing about this incredibly serious conversation. But humour is also a part of this too, isn't it? You know, and because it's part of life, you know. People sort of reflect on my profession and say, I couldn't do what you do. And I, would, I couldn't be miserable all day. And I said, do you know what? When I'm on a funeral, because I'm smiling because I want to show my family, the family I'm looking after, that I've got things covered, that I'm there to reassure them, actually there for them. And I'm there to make sure that this final day is the best possible thank you and goodbye that we can possibly, you know, organise for that family. And that means I need to be able to smile, encourage the the event itself. You know, we, we, we organise such a lot of things and it such a lot has to happen in the right way on the day. And that... That, I think, is probably part of, of being a good funeral director is to be, you know, that, that swan-like thing is, is actually being calm and reassuring, but know you've organised the detail and you've checked the detail and you know that, you know, things are going to happen. And, and I think that, you know, that's always part of being a good funeral director is being able to deal with the unexpected and, and handle it. Because uh, you're there for the family, you're there to try and minimise disruption for that family if you possibly can. Yeah, it's a really vital role. And like I said all along, I can't thank my funeral director enough. He has no idea the importance that he played in my life. I, I'll probably talk about him forever because he was so important. I think that's so wonderful. And thank you for sharing that with me and, and with, with everyone who's listening, I think, because I, I feel very proud of my profession, knowing that the, the impact that him and his team were able to make you know on you and it I, I keep telling my colleagues you know what we do and how we do it has a lifetime impact on every family we look after yeah but let's leave it on the positive impact because we're now out of time David but I've really enjoyed the conversation it was a little bit challenging for a while there but thank you thank you for everything that you do and, and all the families that you support <laughs> thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. you. You've done so well. And keep keep doing that as well, Jenna. Keep strong and keep sharing. Do you know what? You shouldn't feel embarrassed about when you feel emotional or when you... It's human. It's the right thing to do. The last thing I will say, and I will shut up, is that grief and bereavement is the price we pay for love. You know, it's, it has to be worth it in order to, be, to know that you've been able to love someone and have them in your lives. And you've got to accept that this is the price you pay. Lovely. David, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I said that was going to be a challenging conversation and it was. However, I do think that it's highlighted how special people are who do, you know, that kind of work and how it seems to be a calling as opposed to a career choice. So thank you so much to my guest, David Collingwood from the Co-op Funeral Services. Now, this is the short series on losing a loved one. And next week, my guest is Judith Wright. And Judith is a celebrant and she's going to share her story as to what brought her to becoming a celebrant and what that actually means to her and how she's helped others. So I do hope that you will join us in the next part of this series. And I hope that this is really helping and being informative to you also. So thank you so much for tuning in to The Good Grief Conversation. I'm your host, Janet Jones, and I really look forward to speaking with you next week. Now, also don't forget that you can get hold of the podcast extras. We are now getting quite a library of gifts in there that are really helpful, you know, with the grieving process and also just with life in general. There are some really fantastic resources, so I highly recommend those. Just head over to thegoodgriefconversation.com 
www.ebooksandmoreshow.com and you'll be able to sign up there for podcast extras and you'll also get the opportunity to support this program if you so wish to. Anyway, I look forward to speaking with you next week. In the meantime, you take care of yourself and I'll see you then. Bye for now.